talk tickle me ekmar the results laughable and i'm going to give you a quick update today about what's new in terms of outcomes and what's new in the way people are approaching ecmo i want to start with background and brief history followed by the indications the results new updates and finally conclusions uh, i'm going to start and end with perception and reality so on the left we have outcome Second column is the CT surgeon's views. And in the final column, essentially everybody else's view. So patient survives, CT surgeon, I am great. Cardiologist, pulmonologist, intensivist, patient didn't need ECMO. Patient dies, surgeon, if only they would have called us sooner. And of course, everybody else, if the patient dies, says to the surgeon what happened. This is true now, this was true yesterday, this will be true tomorrow. Brief history, we all know, essentially the invention of the heart-lung machine back in 1953. <clears throat> we are now over 70 years later, or close to 70 years, with many great developments that have improved the outcomes of ECMO. In more recent years, Beyond just innovative cannulation techniques and cannulation sites, we've seen the uh, flourishing of ambulatory ECMO for patients bridged to lung transplant, and we've seen a growth in donor and organ ECMO, which I spoke a little bit about yesterday. The total number of adult ECMO cases to date worldwide is about 20,000. And the volume of adult ECMO has increased by over 400% in the span of five years for which we have data on growth. Indications, general categories for VA ECMO are of course cardiogenic shock from a variety of causes, eCPR, which has been growing, and that's primarily when ECMO is placed in the ER for patients arriving uh, with various forms of cardiac arrest. Severe hypothermia, it's the most efficient way to rewarm a patient that comes in with severe profound hypothermia. And finally, for organ retrieval, which we spoke about. VV ECMO, we have more formalized guidelines. We have the ELSO guidelines, and they break it up into when it's suggested you put someone in ECMO and when it's strongly indicated. And I'm going to go to this into a little bit more detail, but it's dependent on two things. The ratio of your PO2 to the fraction of inspired oxygen, and on the Murray score, which I'm also going to go in. And so there's a strong and strongest recommendation based on what these values are. Aside from these guidelines, you also have guidelines based strictly on severe hypoxemia with rising PEEP requirements, severe hypercapnia, as measured by pH, not your PCO2, your acidosis, and very high plateau airway pressures which spell trouble in the near future. So the Murray score. The Murray score is a lung injury score for the mortality for ARDS. On the top, you see the score. The scores are actually average. So unlike most scoring system where you add numbers, for this score, you average them. The nice thing about that is the Murray score is still valid if you don't have all the data. You just ignore the one that you don't have. So the four pieces of information are the chest x-ray. How many quadrants, if you broke the x-ray into four squares, how many of those quadrants have uh, consolidation? The other one is hypoxemia, the value I just spoke to you about. That ratio from left to right. A higher number means the lungs are functioning better. PEEP, how much PEEP is required. And lung compliance, which is just measured by the ventilator that your respiratory therapist can just do as a readout during the normal ventilation. So as you go from left to right, the values are worse and the prognosis is worse. If you have a Murray score of two or three, your mortality is 50% from the ARDS. If you have a Murray score of three to four, your mortality is 80%. 
For those who know me, I make lots of mnemonics, so I have one for this that I teach the residents. CHOPS for chest x-ray, hypoxemia, peep, and stiffness. Easy way to remember it. We've learned some lessons from mechanical circulatory support, particularly chronic mechanical circulatory support, which really had a pattern of adoption and outcomes that are being mimicked by ECMO today. In mechanical circulatory support, and mostly I'm talking about the chronic support field, we initially had very poor outcomes. And how did we improve the outcomes? We improved it by three primary focus areas, by improving our selection, by improving the technology and techniques, and optimizing perioperative care. And through a combination of these three subject areas, the outcomes for durable mechanical circulatory support, which I'm gonna talk about in a couple of hours, are much better. And what we need to do is apply that paradigm to ECMO. Current outcomes with VA ECMO, don't get too bogged down by the slide, I'm gonna show you a better summary of it, are really all over the map. And you'll see this repeatedly. Now, who publishes ECMO data? Places that are doing well with ECMO or, patients that are, or places that are doing poorly with ECMO? There's obviously publication bias and you've always got to keep that in mind. And you've got to make sure that you're looking at the right piece of data and are appropriately skeptical on what that piece of information is giving you. So let's, for example, look at this table and look at the survival to discharge, which is the second to last column. Undoubtedly, that's a better thing to look at than the ability to wean from ECMO. Ability to wean from ECMO means nothing to me if the patient dies the next day. Kind of like length of stay, right? So ability to wean from ECMO is not the appropriate focus. Survival to discharge may not be so good either, right? We have various places we can send patients when we discharge them. It means one thing if they go to a rehab facility, it means another if they're going to LTAC. All right, please keep this in mind whenever you look at the data. 30-day survival is pretty good, but as you know, many of these patients are there much longer and end up dying. Same thing for VV ECMO, all over the map. Probably the most important piece of information is the ELSO registry, which has been accumulating patients since 1990, all right? And the number of centers, which you see in the blue bars, is above 250, and the number of cases has been progressively rising in the United States, and is close to 6,000. Runs by year, what this graph is telling you is if you look at the earlier years, that grayish bar, which accounted for the majority of cases, were the pediatric venous ECMO cases. And you can see that's trivialized nowadays in terms of percentage-wise by the adult cases, both adult VA and VV. Remember, this tells you nothing about the absolute mem numbers, but where the proportions lie. Adult respiratory cases have grown phenomenally. The annual runs are somewhere between 1,500 and 1,600, and cumulative runs is close to 8,000. Same thing goes for the cardiac cases. This is probably the most important slide, all right, when you're talking about outcomes for ECMO. Again, uh, I don't look at the second group of data, the, the survival of the ECMO, to get ECMO taken off. What we look at is the survival to discharge. It's probably the best one we have, but remember the caveats I've already mentioned. And you see it broken up on the adults between respiratory, cardiac, and eCPR, the kind of CPR you do in the emergency room and putting the patients under the worst circumstances. I have a general rule of thumb I teach. It's the 60-40-30 rule. So general rule of thumb, 
The percentage of patients you're going to discharge who go on ECMO for respiratory reasons is 60%, cardiogenic shock 40%, and the emergent ED ECMO 30%. All right? And that's generally true and has been relatively stable and stagnant for, for the past decade. This is a graph showing the survival by diagnosis, all right? And this is for veno-venous ECMO. You can see stabilization over the years as you're going left to right, primarily because of the large numbers now, okay? But really, although there can be some variability based on diagnosis, they're all hovering around the same area, which is shooting around the 60% target. Same thing for the veno arterial. Early years, they were all over the map. And some diagnoses, they were 100% one year and 0% the next. And that's accounting for the too few cases. And here we have the cumulative survival in the ELSO registry. This one is for respiratory, again, shooting for that 60% mark, and for the cardiac, which is the 40% mark. Very important number. The recent studies that I'm just going to very briefly mention have yielded some very provocative and interesting results. So here's a study that compared what happens when you're put on ECMO on the weekday versus a weekend. All right. It's a study out of Korea. And they basically looked at their patients. They had a total of 135 patients placed on ECMO during the week and 65 during the weekend which in and of itself tells you there's a lot for two days, a lot of patients being put on ECMO on the weekends. I think medicine gives up on Fridays. And the survival, as you can see here, in black is the weekday and in white is the weekend. I'm sorry, scratch that. Look at the right-sided diagram. You have the weekday versus the weeknight and I'm sorry, the weekend, and the daytime is in white and the nighttime is in black. The important gist of this is, is there's a marked difference between the weekends and the weekdays, but not much difference between day and night. And all of this kind of makes sense. Uh, not only is there a survival difference, but successful ECMO weaning is different. Uh, cannulation failures on the weekend are much higher. and complications much higher. This is another study that looked at ECMO outcomes based on the volume the center is doing. And so they developed, they, they split them up into terciles based on whether they're low, intermediate, or high volume center. This slide shows you that the hospital mortality rate for low volume centers was 48%, median 60%, high volume 57%. So median and high volume weren't different, but they were actually worse than the low volume. Now you might say, oh, well, maybe the higher volume centers, as, as they often do, are doing sicker patients, but when they did risk stratification, this didn't change. Something to think about. Also very important is there's a big effect if vascular complications occur in an ECMO patient on the patient's survival. This is a single center experience that a total of 84 patients, 20% of them had major vascular complications of the lower extremities. A major vascular complication is defined as a vascular complication requiring surgery, whether that was exploration for bleeding, uh, to reperfuse the lower extremity, or to do fasciotomies. The overall survival of this group to discharge was 42%, in line with what we expect for VA ECMO. But there was a huge difference in survival. Ignore the dotted curves. The black solid line above is the survival of patients who did not have a vascular complication. The red line below 
is the survival of patients who did have a vascular complication, a huge difference. It's a little bit complicated because in, in very fine print in the paper, they say that, uh, you know, they try to do peripheral uh, distal ECMO perfusion when the patient was stable enough. And already that gives you questions. Okay, so only the stable patients got the distal perfusion. So you have to take this with a grain of salt because the patients were likely sicker. But there was a big difference in, in the mortality rate of these patients. One thing you can say for sure, if there is a vascular complication, it may be, not be causative, but it's certainly a, a marker for a poor outcome. And what they did see is if you look at, let's see if I can get it there. If you look at the last line here, the no distal perfusion, if you didn't have distal perfusion in FemFem -fem ECMO, you were 18 times more likely to die, okay? So to me, a take home message is, first of all, I don't do FemFem -fem ECMO unless I have to, all right? That means I've gotta get the patient on within seconds. If I do put them on FemFem -fem ECMO, I will convert them to axillary FEM as quickly as possible. All right, but it's a big marker. But if you're going to do fem fem, once you've got the patient perfused, di extend your dissection a little bit distally or percutaneously, go more distally in the artery and give yourself a small limb that's going to be limited by diameter so that you can perfuse the leg. So, in summary, are the results laughable, as I asked last year? For VA ECMO, survival to discharge is 40%. Without ECMO, expected survival is 10% at best. Therefore, VA ECMO at least quadruples your chance of survival. For VV, similar lines of thinking. Expected survival to discharge is 60%. Without VV ECMO, expected survival is 20%. That too is probably generous. And therefore, with VV ECMO, you at least triple your chance of survival. This looks at what I've just said in a different way by the number needed to treat, and all we're saying is that to save a life, you need to treat over, just over three patients. To save a life for VV, just over two. Is this laughable? I don't think so. You have to think about the alternatives. Can we do better? Of course we can. By focusing on those areas that I mentioned before that we focused on with mechanical circulatory support. Keeping in mind, that no matter how good we do, we're still gonna get the same sequelae. <laughs> and really, it's, it's a matter of perception. And we all talk about the half empty, half full. And I, I love this quote best from Mark DeVoe. Some people see the glass as half full, others see the glass half empty. The enlightened are simply grateful to have a glass, or ECMO for that matter. Thank you. <laughs>